Hey, it's Chris with Implied Music, and I'm here with my good buddy, David Brownstein, DJ Trotsky. Today, I'm going to ask him a real important question. How do you play bass? <laughs> So, David, how, how do you play bass? Hey, so Chris wanted me to say, share a few things about how to approach playing bass, particularly in a rock zone. And um, playing with a band is a unique thing. And so, you know, first of all, sometimes we'll play with a pick and sometimes we'll play with our fingers. The, fun, the fact is it's much more fun to play with your fingers. Uh, but if you want to cut through a rock band, I recommend playing a bass because you'll just hear it better. Playing so, with a pick? Playing with a pick. What kind of pick do you use? I used like a nylon something or other. This mm -hmm. was in my pocket. I'll just play play the difference. Here's this. This is a Beatles bass line. Sorry. I think Paul played this one with a pick because it's a pretty complicated part. Often you'll hear people say, oh, play the bass with the kick drum. I think ignore that advice. But what we want to really do is leave a hole for the snare drum. When you leave a hole for the snare drum, we'll demonstrate that with our, our loop today. When you leave a hole for the snare drum, the drummer will instantly start to smile and the other drummer will instantly go, oh, I love this bass player. Who is this guy or gal? So here, like... So Chris is playing ace notes there, right? Exactly. But when we were talking, when we were programming this drum, I was like, no, keep the hats quarter notes because then it leaves him space for him to do eighth notes on that keyboard thing, right? Exactly. I mean, that's a typical keyboard trick as well. I want to get out of the way of everybody. So what do I do? I play up where nobody else can play. Piano can play higher than anybody. So absolutely. Right? Way the heck up there. That's what we do. You know, if I play down here, I'm fighting with the bass player and they're going to come slap me. I'm, yeah. If the bass, <laughs> if, if I'm playing a bass part and the guitar player or the piano player is playing my note, I'm like, screw you, man. First of all, I'll try to talk to them out of it. And then if I can't, I'll play, I, I will go to a different register so it's not redundant. So everyone has a job to, to, to fit, a place to fill, a slot to fill, almost like there's layers. And, and it's not just in the frequency spectrum, it's in the rhythmic kaleidoscope. Yeah, it's definitely, it's in the rhythm and the harmony, all, harmony also. This is reminding me of, I heard Don was the great producer who was also a bass player. He was saying when all the records he produces, he always makes sure that once they have a melody, he keeps every instrument a, 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 major, a third away, a third above, a third below. So there's, a, there's leaving a harmonic hole for the, the voice, and this is partly why I like to don't do my major voicings on my productions until I've got a vocal, because I know what the singer's doing. I can make sure I'm always staying out of his or her way. How do you choose what note to play? Well, in general, I always have start kind of well. If I'm if someone gives me the charts, I'll just start with the root whatever the root is. Right. Although one of the things that's been interesting in our collaborations is you'll play what I would call a kind of weird, cool, sophisticated chord, and I'll be intuitively looking for the root, which you don't, wasn't always what you expected the root to it be. It happens, it's happened more than once. Because um, I tend to play rootless voicings, they're ambiguous, and it's, it's natural to be able to hear it a couple of different ways. Those are not unpleasant surprises, although they are surprises. And a couple of our best tracks have been come out of that happy accident. Well, yeah, Chris is writing the chordal thing. It seems to be sort of tonic agnostic at times, or That's he like, likes the fact so that if, it's flexible. If I, if I play a chord like this, it, it, I mean, the lowest note I'm playing is an A, but... But I'm hearing... 
right. just hearing the D. I'll just start playing with whatever I hear and then kind of riffing and exploring, experimenting. What's an interesting rhythm? What is a way that I can give movement to it? If there's a lot of movement on the chords, I'll probably try to not go with all that. I'll try to stay different. And if there's very little movement, I'll give it more movement. That Contrast. brings up a, a, a question, and maybe it's the last question that we have time for in this video. And it's like, uh, it's about fills. I, I mean, I know that that you've got from years of playing, um, like hand shapes, which wind up being parts of your sort of pattern relationship to filling. Um, so I, I just wonder if you could maybe share some of how that works or, you know, what you're thinking around it is, or maybe it's not thinking, maybe it's a feeling. Well, it's funny. So it's what I kind of call the, the Keith Richards effect. It's like, what is the place you can play the song with moving your hand as little as possible? So you're essential. I mean, I know this from playing with you a lot. You, your, your fills are, are functionally diatonic, frequently pentatonic, right? And that's just part of the nature of the box of, of the bass and the guitar. But there's a, a fluidity as well. And I just wonder, like, where that comes from. Okay, I think it came from learning scales on the guitar from a book. I mean, we're always kind of walking to where's the next chord. So in this case, I'm like, how do I get to that E? Sure. Right. And I'm not really sweating it. I know pretty much any passing tone will work. That's right. I mean, you just use a chromatic passing tone to get there, not in the scale, but like you say, totally works. So if I can recap, and hopefully you'll help me if I've forgotten something. Uh, so uh, the first thing is pick or fingers, right? And you're up, you come down on the side of the pick a lot. Well, of the, the Jamerson stuff I just played just now was, I think he played play with his with fingers. His thumb. Did he play with his yeah. thumb? Finger. Yeah, right. It's a finger. It's a kind of. But, a but those kinds of, like if you play those. Right. It's different now. It's, now yeah. it's like Chris Squire. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the second thing you said was, y people say, play with the kick drum a lot. And I'm guilty of programming synth bass, for instance, with the kick drum a lot. In fact, I had a band in the 80s in New York where we actually had the output of the drum machine triggering a synth. And that was, we would just change the note on the keyboard and it would be the bass. Like, the kick was the bass. And, and you know, an 808, is it kick, is it bass, right? But you say this, leave a hole for the snare. Drummer will love you, and suddenly, the every time I find audition for somebody, if I just leave a hole for the snare, the drummer's like, oh, man. Third thing, um, and it comes up in the work that you and I do together a lot, is the choice of the bass note can alter the perception of the chord voicing. There's that famous story about uh, Joni Mitchell beginning her work with, with Jocko, and the reason they stuck together so long and so effectively was that he, unlike so many other bass players, session players, wasn't asking for uh, a chord chart. And a lot of the time, Mitchell's um, writing on the guitar uh, was in alternate tunings that gave you know, voicings that were ambiguous and strange. And she wasn't naming the chords. She just had a sound. The sound had a feeling. This is this feeling. This is that feeling. And Jocko played to the sound instead of to the chart. Well, she, yeah, and she called those chords like chords of inquiry. Chords of inquiry. It's like, what does it really mean? What does it feel like? And her her melodies were innovative in, in, in inquiring about what the emotional tone and her chords were. And Jocko did the same thing. He was like, I, I can continue to ask the same inquiry, the same question right. in yeah. a way. Yeah, that's right. Jeez, thanks, David. Cool. Um, we, we have David and I have three videos now because he's been here for a week, and, and you should try to check them out together. And you have a couple of channels yourself. Yeah, check me out on DJ Trotsky, my electronic music, and um, also a total artist program where I do a conversation with industry professionals on how to improve your creative life as a musician and your business life as, as a musician and... Uh, yeah, I'm launching a new, uh, my rock band channel called Million Dollar Days. But yeah, check out DJ Trotsky. A lot, a lot of cool stuff there. A lot of collaborations with, collaborations with Chris there too. Well, thanks for tuning in. I, I hope this has been useful. Um, you know, like and subscribe. You've been on YouTube before. You know the drill. And uh, Bass. I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>